Hi, thanks for watching. Okay, so in this video, I'd like to talk about the legal and psychological situation of the Alaska Airlines captain. Um, this was Joseph D. Emerson. Okay, the Alaska Airlines captain who had a mental health incident while he was sitting jump seat on a Horizon Air Embraer 175. Um, this happened on Sunday, October 22nd. And um, basically, Joseph D. Emerson had, you know, he had a serious, um, serious on uh, like a, a sudden onset of like a psychotic, basically psychotic symptoms while he was sitting jump seat in, in a cockpit. I, I think they were climbing up to or actually le starting to level at flight level 310. So that's about 31,000 feet. And uh, at that altitude uh, or, or while they were climbing up to that altitude, but I think they were, they were, you know, around 30,000 feet. Um, he just, he, he made a gesture that was very strange and said something like, I'm not, I'm not okay. And then he just stood up and, and tried to grab and, and pull the, um, the, the fire handles, um, that would have, um, if he had been successful, he would have released, uh, uh, fire bottles into the engines and pro possibly made it very hard to restart the engines. Okay. So that was a very serious, um, very serious moment. And it was just by, you know, I'm sorry, by the grace of God, it was just, it was just, uh, just tremendously lucky that the, uh, the flight crew was able to kind of notice what was happening and actually overpower him and get him out of the cockpit. So anyway, this is a very serious incident. Um, and okay, just to guys, let you guys know, I mean, I do have some experience as a professional pilot. It was decades ago, but you know, um, but I have, I have some experience in aviation and I also have experience in uh, criminal defense. Okay. Um, I've been a lawyer since, um, since 2002. And, uh, so that's more than 20 years and I've worked, uh, primarily in civil, uh, civil litigation, but I've like the last, um, Let's see how much is it. The last 13 years or so, I've been working in uh, criminal defense. Well, 12 years, let's say. Last 12 years or so, I've been working in uh, federal criminal defense and uh, state criminal defense in Florida, but also federal. Okay, so I do have some idea of how the laws work. And I have looked at the Oregon statutes on um, on the second degree murder and uh, voluntary intoxication. Okay. And I've also looked at the applicable federal uh, law uh, because he's being prosecuted both in federal and state court. Okay. So basically, um, just to review exactly the facts, because there's there's more to it. It wasn't just a simple psych, uh, psychiatric incident. All right. It was complicated. Um, just to let you guys know, I mean, uh, just by way of background. OK, uh, Joseph Emerson um, ha has a very good career, a very good history. Um, apparently he was um, I think he was an athlete in high school and just a very healthy, very outgoing, uh, probably way above average mental health. Um, and he became a pilot and started working with Horizon Air back in 2001. Okay. And apparently had an unremarkable career. I mean, nothing, nothing strange about it that, that, that I've been able to see. Um, and then he, um, I think it was, well, I'm not sure exactly when it was, but it was probably like maybe, uh, maybe around 2009, 2010, 2011, something like that started working with a Virgin America. Okay. And Virgin America was an all Airbus. I think it, well, at least I think he was flying Airbuses. Let's, I'm, I, I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I'm pretty sure he was flying Airbuses for Virgin America. And, um, at some point Virgin America merged with, uh, with Alaska or Alaska bought, bought out, uh, Virgin America. So he, he, uh, he became, he was sort of inherited into Alaska airlines from the, from the merger with uh, Virgin America. And he was flying uh, Airbuses for Alaska. I don't see any evidence that he got his type rating in the Boeing 737 until just very recently. Okay, so as I understand it, he became a captain before he became type rated in the 737, which is really the main fleet of Alaska Airlines. So um, anybody around aviation knows that Airbuses are a completely different aircraft. And so if you're going to uh, assess the the complete let's say stress level. Well, if you're going to do like a stress profile of, um, of Joseph Emerson, you have to include the, the stress of the, the transition to Boeing from working on Airbuses for, for so long. He's probably on Airbuses for probably more than 10 years that, that I can see. And, and if I'm wrong by a couple of years, let's just say I'm sort of spitballing the, the actual, um, the actual number of years, but it's probably in the neighborhood of about 10 years flying Airbuses. 
And so, um, you know, it's such a different f- of cockpit philosophy and flight control philosophy. And, uh, you know, I would imagine personally, you know, transitioning out of after 10 years of flying Airbuses to Boeing, probably be a little bit of stress and a little bit of adjustment. So that has to be one factor in his overall stress profile. OK, I'm assuming he was a pretty good pilot. So, you know, not to say that it's any big deal, but it's it's on the table. You know what I mean? Um, the other thing, too, is that. Um, from what I can tell, during the COVID pandemic, he was pretty politically vocal, I guess, in his Twitter. Um, I just saw that, you know, he, he, had, he had real opinions. He had real concerns about how the pandemic initially was affecting airlines. And I think Alaska, it was very clear that Alaska was uh, very aggressive in trying to get a lot of, let's say, more senior pilots to retire early because, you know, they were, they were clearly struggling with the, uh, you know, the economic impact of the, of the pandemic. So, you know, probably some pilots more than others, you know, different, different people are different, but some people can react very badly to those kind of, um, you know, like major economic uh, threats to their career, you know. And apparently uh, Joseph Emerson had recently purchased a house in California. I mean, that's automatically a, a, a stress, a stress factor, right? Um, and, you know, working in a career that's very susceptible to economic uh, downturns or economic, uh, you know, catastrophes, whatever. So you can imagine, you know, he has he has more than I think he has at least one child, maybe two. But let's just say he has children and he's living in California, recently purchased a house. OK, that's an automatic recipe for stress, extra stress. If if you feel like you're in a career and he, since he wasn't a super senior captain, I mean, the whole cocktail there is a sort of a recipe for for being under a lot of stress. Also, at the time, I think he was on the Airbus fleet, which is a smaller fleet. So um, you just put all the, everything together and he was probably more susceptible to, let's say, flying a lot less, maybe getting a lot less paid a lot less during the pandemic. So he was, um, you know, he was really eager and really aggressive in his Twitter um, commentary and opinions about, you know, how the government should, you know, should provide support to airlines or whatever. And so, you know, just on the table, you know, the, the pandemic clearly had some impact on his overall stress profile. And then, you know, he was probably one of the last pilots to transition out of um, Airbus because Airbus, they just got rid of Airbuses just in the last couple of months, basically. And um, he apparently got type rated in the Boeing 737, I think in July. Okay. As far as I can tell, right. That's just the records that I've seen. Um, so in other words, just very, very recently off the Airbus. And so, you know, anytime you're dealing with transitions, with things that are just new and challenging, you know, coming out of the pandemic, I mean, those are just kind of obvious uh, items that to some extent have to be on the table in terms of his overall stress profile. OK, now, uh, since he was arrested, he, he's apparently been as honest as he can be. I mean, now I I'm just going to go ahead and say. Whenever mental illness is, is in, involved with anything, especially if you're a pilot and you're sort of trying to, like, say, be really honest and talk to the police, I would say that because mental health is so stigmatized in aviation and rightly so. Right. I mean, I think I think we need to get away from this idea that we that, you know, the FAA should be open to people that have mental issues. I, I think to be quite honest. I don't think it's just like firearms. Um, nobody has the right to fly a plane. All right. Well, I'm sorry. It, how do you say? I mean, we, you, ha- you have the right to be able to fly a plane, um, just like with firearms. You have the right to use a firearm. But I think whenever there's any issue about your, let's say, your psychological status, OK, I think that right should be very, very conditional. All right. Because why do I say that? Because, you know, I, I myself, I used to be a pilot and I had psych- psychological issues. OK. And I can say you can't you guys can't understand how much I love to fly. OK, you guys can't understand how much I loved aviation. All right. So I understand how how harmful it is, how how much it hurts. OK, but the problem with aviation, it's kind of like being a surgeon like times 200. Right. Because you literally have people's lives in your hands. OK, and I'm sorry, but just even the slightest, even the slight, even just having average psychology. Right. You have so many lives in your hands that I think that kind of takes away the personal rights of, of the individuals who love to fly. Right. And so I really believe, honestly, and it hurts, it hurts for me. Um, but I think that even just having average mental health is probably not enough to be qualified, in my opinion, to be a part 21, uh, you know, airline um, uh, flight crew member. I, I just don't believe that. And I say that with pain because I myself have had uh, mental issues and I would love to see there be more, let's say, flexibility but to be quite honest, um, you know, even something like depression, all right, I'm not talking about bipolar or even psychosis, but just depression, 
depression is known to cause in people sudden onset uh, strange behavior, which can include very self-destructive or suicidal behavior. So anybody who just has any kind of depression, um, you never know when that could suddenly result in some you know, rash, impulsive, dangerous act. And how can you square that with having in your hands, you know, um, 150, 200 lives or potentially multiplied by, like, say, like, say, even to 400 or 600? Because if you're like, say, in a, in a busy airport area, OK, and you do anything that causes an accident with another airplane, let's say a, a midair collision at, a, at an airport like San Francisco, um, you know, or Dallas, Fort Worth or something. And you, could you imagine, you know, uh, a midair caused by, you know, some kind of um, some kind of uh, um, impaired capacity of a flight crew member, you know, causing two air, two fully loaded aircraft to have a midair and everybody dies. I mean, the bottom line is that, and also like the, the worst aircraft accident in, in the history of aviation was in the Can Canary Islands in uh, the early seventies. It was Pan Am and Lufthansa, or it was a KLM, sorry, KLM and Pan Am, but these were two 747s that collided in part, I believe, because of psychological issues, right? Because you had a captain, a KLM, KLM captain, I believe it was a captain, who was very arrogant and he was known to be an arrogant person. So he had personality um, issues, right? And he apparently was very impatient to get back uh, to get back to the Netherlands, uh, you know, because they had flown to the to the Canary Islands, but they were going to return to to Amsterdam. And apparently he was just like really, uh, you know, really kind of in his typical arrogant mood and sort of in a hurry to get back home. And there was issues with fog and taxiing on, a, you know, on a very, uh, very narrow runway. And um, he he had, a, he had other flight crew in this KLM cockpit were concerned about another 747 that was taxiing that was back taxiing on the same runway. But this captain was just, you know, kind of sloughing off the, you know, the concern and just impulsive to get to get going. And they end up colliding with another 747 um, on takeoff. The other 747 hadn't hadn't uh, hadn't exited the runway uh, while taxiing in fog. OK, so right there you can see. And that wasn't even depression. That wasn't even psychosis. That was just arrogance. That was just a personality characteristic. You know, so the bottom line is that um, that captain, that KLM captain probably did not qualify for any actual di diagnosis. So in other words, he wasn't even, let's say, he was probably technically a normal person, right? And that's why I say that even normal psychology is probably not enough. Average normal people have their moments, have their, you know, have their arrogant moments, have their, their rough around the edges. I think to be, uh, to be a, a professional pilot, I think you have to be sort of like an Eagle Scout. An Eagle Scout is, is above even a Boy Scout and Boy Scouts are above average, right? So it's sort of like you do have to be sort of, I think, above average in psychology. So I can understand why, um, why, why any psychological issue is major taboo. And so that's tough for me because, you know, you want to have openness, right? But I think it's almost like, you know, to be a pilot, I think you should have to sign a contract saying that I fully understand you know, that by getting into this career that I need to have way above mental health, okay? And that I also need to be very, be very open about any issues I may be having with my mental health, okay? And at the same time, understanding that I may forfeit, you know, my privilege, you know, to carry passengers. Um, but maybe what can be done in the aviation industry is to make it easier for pilots to, to sort of reveal their issues and maybe create some buffer zone where you can at least attempt to rehabilitate a pilot who's having, let's say, temporary issues with alcohol, maybe with personality issues, maybe with uh, depression to some low grade level, you know, but but that pilots, when they get into aviation, they can just fully understand and happily, happily, even though it hurts, you know, sort of sign the contract, which is that, you know, I fully understand that I may become permanently disqualified, if, you know, if it's found that my mental health has any questions, you know. And so in, in other words, to sort of welcome the welcome, welcome the fact that it does have a real stigma but somehow understand that if for some reason you were permanently disqualified, that somehow, let's say, maybe maybe the maybe in exchange for, for understanding you could lose your career, maybe the, the federal government could set up more um, more comprehensive disability laws as applied to pilots, where, for example, if a pilot even has subclinical mental issues but becomes disqualified from from being a, a professional pilot, that they would be entitled to a special disability, um, you know, setup, um, kind of like, kind of similar to social security disability, but probably with a lot more benefit. Okay, so in other words, um, probably 
let's say in exchange for getting a major disability package where, you know, pilots could have, you know, fantastic disability uh, benefits. All right. In exchange for that, maybe pilots could volunteer for a very stringent uh, psychological evaluation when they get their first, uh, you know, their first uh, airline physical. In other words, when they get their first class one FAA medical after being hired by a part 2121 carrier, maybe there could be like a new, um, you know, comprehensive psychological screening. Okay. Comprehensive. Right. But then if you pass that, and then if later it's found that you have any kind of defect, you know, that, that even creates a question, right. Then maybe there could be like a, just a fantastic disability package combined with maybe, um, like alternative job relocation where maybe they could work in maintenance, and or maybe they could work in um, you know maybe some level of dispatch where you know to, to being supervised right but you know at some level where they couldn't possibly put lives in danger but where they get to still use their skills as aviation professionals you know um, or even just something in the airline but the bottom line is that you know if if there could be more protections for pilots where they don't feel like they're going to lose their livelihood okay then they might be more willing to sort of sign that contract saying that I understand this is a you know, this is a, a life threatening career um, that involves danger to the public. Right. And that I do not have a right. OK, to to have, let's say, even just average mental health and still be able to hold people's lives in my hand. But in exchange for that, maybe they could have just fantastic, comprehensive disability um, whenever mental health becomes a question. So that people don't feel like they're going to endanger their their family's livelihood, you know, um, Anyway, so, you know, the bottom line is um, I do agree there should be a stigma, right? I do agree that even average mental health is not enough to carry people's lives in, in your hands. I agree with that. It hurts me because I have my own psychological issues. However, I think in exchange for that, I think the government, um, you know, the government and or airlines should set up a sort of a pension fund or sort of a special disability fund. So that people who do have mental issues, who do come forward, you know, they may have some, some small chance to rehabilitate, but if in the more likely case that they end up becoming disqualified due to mental condition, that they could have fantastic benefits, right? And so that would at least allow pilots not to feel so, um, so I guess, so shy and so, um, so paranoid about, you know, revealing their, their private mental suffering. The other thing too, is maybe part of that contract could be that on the one hand, if you're honest, you get a fantastic, uh, uh, disability benefit, but if you're dishonest and if you walk around sort of concealing mental health issues that you could potentially be prosecuted federally and end up uh, maybe going to jail. I don't know. I mean, the bottom line is there has to be a setup where people are motivated to be honest, but they also understand that being dishonest and concealing uh, a mental health issue could potentially be a criminal, um, you know, a criminal act. I mean, I don't know. The bottom line is we, we have to create a situation where pilots can take the bitter pill and accept that they may lose their career very easily if they even have average mental health. And just to know that before they even get into the career. All right. But then set up the disability system for pilots where, they, where they're not going to feel like they're going to lose their livelihood. So, you know, something has to be done because it, uh, presently, what's happening and what happened with this pilot with, uh, with Joseph Emerson is that he was, I think he was scared. All right. Because you add up all the stress of, you know, what was ever happening with the pandemic. And then he's switching aircraft. He's coming out of Airbus. He's now more fully integrating into Alaska. He stayed in the, on the Airbuses for so long. He was probably, he probably remained with the whole, with, with the few pilots that, that, you know, he probably remained in a, in a group of pilots and in a culture that was still kind of a holdout from the Virgin America. OK, at least to some extent. I mean, you know, I'm sure there were a lot of Alaska pilots that wanted to fly Airbuses, but I'm sure he was, you know, probably in a in a group in San Francisco. I think he was San Francisco based. I'm not quite sure about that, but let's just say he was San Francisco based. But I think he was basically in sort of in the Airbus uh, subculture. Um, so you can't take you can't eliminate the stress factor of him sort of now fully integrating into Alaska and the Boeing culture. And maybe there was some slight, you know, company culture difference or just personalities or whatever. And um, and then also the insecurity that in his transition to Boeing, he didn't have an opportunity, I don't think, to be a first officer. He transitioned just straight cold into being a, um, a Boeing captain with apparently uh, zero experience with Boeing and also having flown so long in the Airbus. So, you know, it's a lot of pressure. And um, anyway, everything needs to be on the table, including just the natural stress 
of having to support a family in a in California where houses are so expensive and with children. And maybe, you know, to be quite honest, if he started having any mental health issues, any any feeling deep down inside that he was not, you know, completely solid, right? He knows that he his how would you say his ability to pay for an expensive house in California to raise kids really depends on him being super sharp and really on top of it. And so I guess if there's anything that created any any insecurity in him, he's going to feel like his whole livelihood and his children's livelihood is is at risk. Okay, now, in addition, okay, while he was talking to police. Now, here's the thing. I he was talking to police. I'm not going to assume that everything thing he said to police was honest, even in these days, even though he wants to be just because th there is still inherently structurally so much stigma in aviation right around mental illness that he he admits this much. He admits that 48 hours before the flight, he took uh, magic mushrooms, psychedelic mushrooms for the first time. Right. And this is partly because he's been struggling with depression and hasn't been saying anything about it. He's been keeping it to himself that he's been struggling with depression, which is already bad. OK, and let's just be honest. If you're if you're a pilot, let alone a captain, a captain, um, a part one at one twenty one airline and you're you're privately struggling with depression, you're not telling anybody about it for six months. I think that should be by itself crime. OK, now. I'm sympathetic. Like, I don't want to I don't want to like throw the book at this guy. Right. But I think it should be a crime. But under a setup, under a system where pilots also have a wonderful uh, reward if they're honest. Right. At, at the present, I can't say that a, a fully honest pilot in his situation, in, in Emerson's situation, I can't say that a fully honest pilot who's fully honest with their depression OK, is necessarily going to be rewarded for that honesty. Not necessarily. OK, yes, airlines have some protection for pilots who are struggling with mental issues. OK, but if depression reaches a certain level where there's any actual suicidality. Right. And if he is, let's say, a little dishonest about that, he's already he's still in the dishonesty zone. And even through the resources of getting help through the airline, um, he may be concealing something that could disqualify him from aviation. Right. Which is suicidality. Right. Um, and just in case, I mean, anybody, you know, who knows the FAA, uh, the FARs, um, as far as I understand, um, if a person is suicidal, okay, I think that does get close to being one of the most disqualifying, uh, features, uh, psychological, uh, conditions as far as, you know, having ever being able to get a, a class, a class one medical, right? So, um, I think, I think he was right to be scared and also maybe motivated. Uh, I th well, I think the, the way this the way the situation is set up, the way the, the the system is set up today, I think pilots are actually I can understand them not being honest about depression because I think depression gets very close to being uh, disqualifying if there's any suicidality. Right. So I think we need to be um, in instead of trying to, like, say, maybe loosen the laws and allow suicidal pilots to keep flying, because I, I just don't think that's smart. I think w what we need to look at is how we could improve the, the, the setup for pilots so they have fantastic disability uh, protection, OK, so that they are motivated to be honest about suicidality. Right. Even though it, it will threaten their career. OK. And we just have to set it up differently. Uh, we have to allow more. A much, much more uh, benefits and reward rewards to pilots who are honest about that. Right. Um, anyway, so let's just say the present setup has it so that I I think it's criminal him flying without reporting his depression. But the way it's set up, I can see why he would be too afraid to say anything. OK, just because he's worried about his family and his livelihood. Right. So in other words, pilots are in a, situa are in a situation where economically they're under a lot of pressure to be to be uh, to act criminally. OK, pilots are under a lot of pressure to criminally operate aircraft while they're sort of concealing suicidal or very depressive uh, conditions. OK, but the bottom line is he was struggling with depression, whether we like it or not. OK, um, and of course, he, he wasn't just going to go to a psychiatrist because that's going to ruin that's going to really threaten his career. I'm sorry. Anybody who says that airlines you know, provide you know, lots of resources to people who are suicidal. I don't know about that. I think maybe light, light depression, maybe. But suicidality, I think you're getting close. You're getting close to, to jeopardizing your career. OK, so um, so I would say that um, I don't think even now, even as he's spilling his guts and being totally honest, I think he may have motivations to sort of shave the truth a little bit just because it's an area of such high stigma and danger, uh, economic danger for airline pilots presently. Right. 
So I think that he's probably still going to be spinning his story just a little bit nicer than it actually was. Okay. So at, at present, what he's saying is that uh, he had a friend who died. Okay. And that really affected him. My take on that is that he probably had other issues, underlying issues, and that his friend dying kind of, kind of, um, sorry, my, my neighbors have dogs. <laughs> I am so sorry. It really bothers me. Um, try to make these videos anyway, but no, my, my, I think what's more likely, okay, is that the, the friend dying was sort of like the straw on the camel's back or not the straw on the camel's back. It was probably like the, the boulder on the camel's back, but I think the camel's back was already a little bit shaky. Okay. Just because, um, like I said, he is transitioning, uh, you know, he, for probably months before he transitioned to Boeing, he probably knew that the Airbus was, was disappearing from Alaska. So he was, he was facing a major cultural change in terms of his work, his work situation. I'm not saying he was insecure about being a bad pilot. It's just, it's just a factor, you know, it's just something that, that takes a little bit of comfort out of his job and causes him to sort of be forced into sort of a different uh, routine and maybe a little more challenge. Um, you know, so I would say, um, he probably had a lot of things going on coming out of the pandemic, maybe just, just general, um, chronic insecurity about, about, you know, having to pay, pay so much money to own a house in California and raise kids. And, um, I don't know, maybe, maybe he also had maybe a, a little bit of a sensitivity in his personality that, that never really showed up until the pandemic. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes people have very sort of unknown frailties in their personality that sort of like rocks that come to the surface, you know, they only come to the surface when you have something like a pandemic. Right. And, uh, a lot of pilots out there probably don't even know they have a little frailties in their personality and they're not going to show up until they're under major life stress. And then, you know, it's kind of like the soldiers that go to war, you know, uh, maybe some get PTSD, some don't. How do you know? You'll never know. I can never say, you know, I could find a person uh, who looks like they're a pussy, looks like they're frail, looks like they're, you know, they're very delicate. And then you go to war and they might actually do better than some tough uh, Rambo type who, who somehow gets PTSD. You just the, the, the human personality is so mysterious. OK, that when you take something like a pandemic, you take something like like, say, a, a, an airline merger, you know, and the effects and the, the the hangover of an airline merger and just all these little things, you know, raising kids having a major, you know, having, having a house that's super expensive in California, you know, and different people over time under different conditions are going to show different uh, uh, frailties in their personality. It's, it's impossible to predict. Right. But, the, and also we don't know if there's other issues, let's say with Joseph Emerson's family. Right. In other words, um, maybe there was just a little bit of strain in the marriage and maybe almost imperceptible, but just all these little things sort of adding up. Um, also, if, by chance, if he was having an extramarital relationship, I mean, we may never know because may, maybe because he loves his family so much, he could just never bear to hurt them, even though he wants to be honest, right? Because I think in the United States, especially when you have a career like being a pilot, you're sort of looked on automatically like you're an Eagle Scout. You know what I mean? You're sort of held to such a high esteem in the public that it's, it's such a shame. It's such a disgrace if a pilot would have to let's say if the pilot actually loves his wife and he loves his family and would ever have to admit having any, any kind of um, anything disloyal to the marriage or whatever. So, you know, I'm not saying that happened, but I'm saying if, if, if there were to be additional tiny factors, like say some, some, even the most informal infidelity, you know, or something private, maybe even, I'm sorry, maybe even having, a, you know, watching pornography and just feeling bad about it or just the tiniest thing, right. Something disloyal. I think it's extremely likely that he may on some act, abstract level, maybe want to share those things, but maybe because of the, the stigma, again, it's back to the stigma and back to the esteem of his, of his profession. Um, I think it's, it's likely that he may reserve for himself some, some of the most uh, shameful, let's say some of the more embarrassing, um, you know, small details about his actual condition. So we, we may never know the actual full condition um, that led up to this, but I think it to just to say he was just depressed. And it was just because a friend died. I think that's probably more the surface. I think below the surface, there's probably a few more slightly, slightly more embarrassing aspects that we may never know. Right. But the bottom line is that, you know, leading up to this incident was months of at least six months of, you know, self-admitted where he's willing to admit that he was struggling with depression and not getting help. Right. Anyway, so, um, 
in the next video, I'm going to do two parts on this, but um, because I do work in criminal defense, um, in the next video, I want to get a little more focused on how the legal cases are going to turn out, how, whether he has, uh, because he did take some drugs, right? He did take uh, magic mushrooms, whether um, this, this whole voluntary intoxication argument, whether he really does not have an insanity defense, or if he doesn't have an insanity defense, how is it realistically likely that